Well, hello and good evening. Welcome to Third Place Books from wherever you are tonight, uh, proving that anywhere can be truly a third place. And wherever you're joining us from tonight, we are glad to have you. My name is Sam. Many of you who are local to the Seattle area here may know me from our three stores at Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, and Seward Park, where I work in our author events program. And you may have seen me up on stage introducing some of your favorite authors in person back in the days when we were gathering in the store. And those days will come again. But in the meantime, we've been doing this author event series live on Zoom, uh, and we're so glad that you've all been joining us for these events. Tonight, I have a couple of authors that we're very fond of, big supporters of indie bookstores, and with a novel that is getting some incredible buzz. So we're so glad that you're all here to check it out. Before we get started, I have just a couple of things I want to say, and the first has to do, of course, with books. And tonight we are here to celebrate a book. It is Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan, the new novel by Deborah Reed. Now, some of you have been hearing that this book has been getting some incredible press. Uh, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, from all quarters, people are so excited about this novel. And I think you'll be excited about this novel too at the end of this event, if you are not already. And tonight, we are gonna drop a link in the chat in just a moment. Your chat bar is on the side of your screen. I'm gonna put a link in there to purchase this book and other books for, by Deborah Reed from Third Place Books. Now, Third Place Books, many of you may know, is a local independent bookstore here in the Seattle area, and we love what we do. But now, more so than ever, our work, this author event series, all of it is supported by one thing and one thing only, and that thing is your book purchase. It is what keeps this machine running day in and day out. And your book purchase is also what allows authors like Deborah Reed and Jenny Shortridge to keep writing and keep working and doing these events and being here for us when we need great writers. So please don't be shy tonight. Uh, pick up a copy of the book, pick up some of Deborah Reed's other books. We'll put links in the chat. I'm sure there'll be something that you will enjoy. We can have these books available for you to pick up at one of our three stores if you're local here to the Seattle area, or we can ship them to you anywhere in the country. We have USPS Media Mail starting at a very reasonable $3.50 per package, and uh, that supports the United States Postal Service, which small businesses like Third Place Books and Cloud and Leaf Bookstore, which I'll do a plug for in just a second, for rely on every day. So uh, please, we thank you for your support and uh, hit that buy button. You will like what you get with this book. Now, if you have questions tonight, uh, about the writing process, about the book, about art, about big things, about little things, doesn't matter. Put those questions into the Q&A box. It's gonna be at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. You can click on that, you can type your question and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the event. And we thank you so much again for your participation. Now, if you enjoy this event tonight, we are doing a lot of these right now, two to three a week, sometimes more. Um, so if you want to check out your favorite authors live from your living room um, throughout, the, throughout the week, throughout the month, we encourage you to check out our website. Thirdplacebooks.com is the place to go. You can check out our events calendar where we're listing new events every single day right now. Authors from all around the country, authors from all around the world joining us. So we are sure there's something else that you will enjoy. You can also subscribe to our email newsletter while you're there. We send out one email a week telling you what is new and what's happening, what's coming up. Uh, we're booking new events for January and February now, so there's going to be more coming down the pipeline very soon. And you can also follow us on social media if that's your cup of tea, at Third Place Books on most of the major platforms, and you'll get up to the minute uh, updates on what we have happening. And uh, again, we really appreciate you keeping in touch, and we thank you so much for your support and for joining us tonight. And now, without further ado, I am so thrilled to welcome two authors who are not only favorite novelists uh, in the Pacific Northwest and beyond and beloved writers, but uh, great friends of indie bookstores. And so we thank them for being here. Uh, Deborah Reed is the author of the novels, The Days When Birds Come Back, Olive, Things We Set on Fire, Carry Yourself Back to Me, and most recently, 
very, very recently, Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan, the new book. She's written two thrillers under the pen name Audrey Braun. She lives on the coast of Oregon, where she is the owner of Cloud and Leaf, the wonderful bookstore, independent bookstore in Manzanita, Oregon. Check it out if you haven't. We'll drop a link in the chat. And tonight, Deborah joins us to talk about her new book, Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. Joining Deborah tonight is Jenny Shortridge. Jenny Shortridge is the author of five novels, including Love, Water, Memory, and When She Flew, and she's currently working on a memoir. Her books have been translated into several languages, optioned for film and TV, and selected for American Booksellers Association, Indie Next uh, Picks, and Library Journal Editors Picks. A lifelong volunteer, she was the co-founder and executive director of Seattle Seven Writers, a nonprofit collective of over 100 Northwest writers that raised money and awareness for literature and literacy from 2009 to 2019. From wherever you're joining us tonight, please join me in welcoming Deborah Reed and Jen Jenny Shortridge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Thanks, Sam. I'm guessing we're on, Deborah. What do you think? I think so. Hi, okay. Jenny. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Here I Hi. am. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You. Um, thanks very much, Sam. You are. Your enthusiasm is really fun in a time like this. <laughs> yes, it's infectious. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you know, first of all, Deborah, I just wanted to check in with you and ask, human to human, in these perilous times, just you know, how are you? Well, uh, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that I live where I live and yeah. I get to do what I get to do, you know, um, with everyone stuck inside around the country and around the world. I get to be in this amazingly beautiful place surrounded by the natural world, um, the ocean, uh, an amazing community, very supportive. Um, you know, I get to own and run a bookstore. Um, I have a book out. I mean, there's just so much to be grateful for. Uh, not to say that it isn't difficult, <laughs> right. but, but um, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely grateful for all that I have. Yeah. Well, How that's, about you? <laughs> me too. I mean, there, okay, what good. else are we going to do right now? Are you going to just keep adapting like we do here for yeah. our book events and we'll just keep plugging along and I feel pretty confident that things will be better. I'm hopeful. I really, really do. Um, so let's talk about your book because it's quite the book. It's a beautiful book. Um, Thank it's, you, Jen. It's about an Oregon artist who has found great fame and retreated from it. And so I, it just really makes me wonder if someone or something inspired this story. Um, somewhat. I, what I wanted to do was create um, a character who was an artist who had lived a very long life that no one really knew about. No one really knew her story but her and her, her uh, since deceased husband Richard knew qu quite a bit of it, but no one knows the whole story except for her. And um, when I was looking at um, how I would create the artwork itself in the book, I, I went to one of my favorite artists, who is Agnes Martin, and she is a, she's an abstract artist uh, who um, was well known for her um, way of evoking um, emotion rather than cerebral thought with her work, mm. and which is unusual with abstract geometric artwork. People are always trying to figure out, well, what does it mean? You know? right, right. What does it stand for? And Agnes Martin's work uh, through color, light, uh, line, space, had the ability to evoke joy and, and um, happiness. And um, that's what I wanted for my character. So I borrowed Agnes Martin's um, style of work for the book. But in the course of, of researching Agnes Martin, I discovered that she too was a very secretive person. Uh -huh. she, she also did not reveal much about her life to other people. And, uh, and she was just, uh, she was very isolated and she was, she was only about the work. And so yeah. the two began to match up um, nicely and, and it really was a, a fortuitous Thing that right. it turned out that way. Right, right, right. Oh, that's really interesting. I have to look that work up. 
Yeah, yeah. she's wonderful. Oh, it sounds great. So um, were you already interested in art and fine art and abstract art? Was that, has that been a passion of yours? Yeah, I'm not an artist myself, but I, I have a great appreciation for art, mm -hmm. uh, fine art, design, architecture. Um, uh, I, I've, I've always, um, I, I, I've once said that I, uh, in, in one of my characters, main characters in my book, Olive, she's an architect. And when I was doing um, research for that, I realized that I, I think I, I might have liked to have been an architect right. or a designer or something like that had I not um, become a writer, or a, you know, um, right. a, a bookseller. But I do have an appreciation yeah. for it. I think people wonder, you know, when we write characters that are fictional, if we're writing, you know, most people assume they're ourselves and they're not yes. typically with fiction. Um, yes. But then they wonder if we're writing about what we would really like to be or would have liked to have done. So that's interesting that you say that yeah. about the architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's that wonderful quote by Susan Sontag, uh, what I wanted was every kind of life and the writer's life seemed the most inclusive. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Very nice. So while you're writing this book, did anything um, surprise you during the process? Did you, um, I don't know, did you find your way into anything you didn't expect to find your way into? Well, the, the way that I write is I don't, I don't do an outline. So I don't really know what's going to happen. And what I do is I kind of just mess around with the characters themselves trying to get to know who they are and, mm -hmm. and place them in time and, and space. And, um, and so I didn't know how the book would end. And because I tell the story through the point of view of several, well, each character in the family has their own points right. of view sooner or later. Right. Um, it wasn't until I started creating each character that I began to understand where the plot was going to take me. Uh -huh. And I knew that I wanted the grandson, Daniel, to have a surprise um, to spring on his family, but I didn't know really what that could but be. And I, I went through a whole bunch of cool. ideas. Yeah. But then I, the one I, as soon as I settled on the one that is in the book, which I won't give away, um, it, it's like, it opened up so many other doors. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it's the whole turning point, I yes. think, for the yeah. whole family. So yeah. maybe, we should, uh, maybe I should ask you to just tell us very briefly what the book is about since I jumped sure. in without yeah, so, even doing that. Right. Okay. So it's a, um, it's about this 93 year old painter. She's come to the end of her life. You know, right away that at the beginning of the book that she has been diagnosed with lung cancer. And she basically has the rest of the summer to um, finish her final painting, which by the way, the, the painting that she's working on is called Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. And she has a grandson named Daniel who lives in Los Angeles and he's a filmmaker, more or less a budding filmmaker. And he's been wanting to make a documentary about her life for a long time. And she keeps refusing him. And at the beginning of the book, there's an earthquake and it literally and figuratively shakes everything up. And Daniel decides it's time for him to come home um, and visit. Uh, by the way, the story takes place here in a town exactly like Manzanita. But the, <laughs> but the it name felt is like Manzanita. Yeah, I it loved is. it. <laughs> uh, but the name is changed to um, Nistaka Beach. But um, so he comes, he comes back and um, and at this point, as as um, Violet is clearly nearing the end of her life, she decides that people are going to tell her story without the facts once she's gone. And she wants to, um, well, two things. She wants her legacy to be known as it truly was, the truth of her story, which is vast and surprising to the whole family. Um, and she also wants to offer up this creative opportunity to Daniel, who then gets to make this amazing documentary about her life. And um, the name of the documentary is also Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. So um, the, there's a bit of historical fiction in it because she's 93. And when her past starts to come up in the story more and more, um, there's sort of a, um, there are two plot lines running. There's the past story. And that is when she's 14 years old, she runs away from home in Georgia. And this is during World War II. And she has to trek all the way across the United States, uh, basically on foot and hopping trains. And um, 
she's trying to make her way to the Pacific Northwest. Um, she's got her eyes set on it. And, um, and so there's, um, it drops back in, in time. And I, I got to do a little bit of research to try to capture that time period. It definitely feels like two journeys woven together, that braided kind of feeling of um, a woman making her way in the world twice, you know, yes. kind of into the world and then kind of out of the world. Yeah, yeah, which that's is, exactly it. Yeah, yeah, which I found really fascinating. Um, well, I'm wondering if maybe we should have you read a tiny bit. Uh, sure, I'd love to. If you'd um, like. So, yeah, here's a passage that, um, it includes, all of the characters are in this small passage here. So there's Violet and then uh, Richard, who is her husband who died 20 years previously. Um, her son, Francisco, who um, some characters call Frank, and her, uh, uh, Francisco's wife, Penny, and Francisco and Penny live downstairs below Violet. And then there's the grandson, Daniel. And I think their old dog, uh, Ladybird, is also in this, <laughs> in this piece. So this is, um, this is a, a turning point when, when Violet starts to, um, when her past starts to come to the surface again, because she's lived many years and um, without having to face it or think about it, and now it's bubbling up to the surface. It was one o'clock in the morning when Violet felt a sharp stitch beneath her ribs. She lay awake, checking her breath, staring through the skylight at constellations appearing and disappearing behind wispy strings of clouds. The wind softened. Every so often, bats fluttered near the eaves. Then a movement outside triggered the motion sensor light behind the house, and Violet rose from bed and went to the window, where she saw a raccoon scurrying across the backyard into the woods. This was the hour of predators. Violet recalled nights spent in the woods, where even the smallest creatures feasted like chiggers on skin. She didn't care to look into the dark, but here, a distant street light breached the hill and shadowed the trees and yard with a midnight blue, and the telephone wire cut a silver streak across the center of the window frame, and it was beautiful to look at. A strange vapor rose from below. Violet knew instantly that it was not the marine layer rolling in from the sea. It billowed upward like smoke. She leaned her head against the glass and spotted Francisco pacing the wooden deck below in his underwear. The small mound of his gut lit by the light of his phone as he smoked a cigarette. Lately, Penny claimed that roast beef and steaks and cheeseburgers would put meat on Violet's bones, and she'd been trying to feed her the way Violet had fed Ladybird toward the end, offering a special reprieve from canned dog food, though Violet understood that Penny didn't intend it that way. Anyway, the meat was working on Francisco's bones instead. It couldn't be over 50 degrees out there, and the soft drizzle would make it feel even colder. But it was the red tip of her son's cigarette moving in the dark that Violet found most strange, the faint fog rising above his head. Had he spent a lifetime hiding this habit from his mother? Had he just now taken it up? She watched until he stubbed the cigarette out against the lava rock and then cupped the butt in his hand. She guessed he would tuck it in the trash where no one would see. Violet had given up smoking decades ago, and at her age, who knew if the cancer had anything to do with what she'd done in her past? She'd gone on to live a very long life in spite of everything. And a grown man smoking outside his own house in the night shouldn't seem such a terrible thing. After all, Richard had smoked cigars right up until the moment of his death, when the one between his fingers dropped onto his chest and burned a tiny hole in his sweater before Daniel had a chance to knock it away. So why was Violet so angry? She crawled back into bed, mad at the world in a way that surprised her. She had been in love with it for so long, she'd forgotten what it was to come up against it. Maybe this is how it works at the end. Like raising a teenager, a rush of ill feeling sets in, making it easier to throw up your hands, step away and say goodbye when the time comes. The stitch in her side burned brighter. She pulled the blanket over her head to shut out the images behind her eyes, but the memories continued to flare. A doctor's large mouth slowly enunciating words through straight white teeth. I can help you. 
Violet had glanced up from chewing her nails. I'm afraid of it, and that's saying something. I'm not afraid of much. Flooding the brain with electricity has a way of nurturing the parts that are suffering, he said, and leaned back and sighed as if, it, as if exasperated. It will make you a better mother. Richard's face turned red with rage. No, Violet said, let the doctor finish what he has to say. Mm, intriguing. <laughs> I've heard it. <laughs> And that's, that's the first moment where you dips into where you start to understand that mental illness was part of um, what she's dealt with. Right. And, um, and, you know, it's also a book about motherhood and parenting. Right. Very and, much so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that I'm, you know, one of your other books descriptions says a tightly plotted, emotionally complex novel about strangers who happen to be part of the same family. Nah. And that's exactly <laughs> what I felt about this novel as well. And I'm, is that at the heart of what you, I mean, is it something that you intentionally do, do you think, talking, bringing these disparate parts of a family together and, and I, them in a Well, I think. I think the family is where, you know, the most interesting relationship dynamics take place. I mean, it's where everything gets worked out from the beginning to the end, you know, and I right. think it's also a place where people tend to, um, because family members know each other over the course of their long lives, um, you know, there are things like when, when someone is young and they, they get in trouble for something, they automatically get pegged as, you know, oh, he stole a bike once, so he's the thief, you right. know. And, yes. and we can't, we spend a lifetime trying to outrun um, or, or replace these um, roles um, that are fitted onto us within our families as we struggle to become who we're going to be or, or would like to be. And, you know, it's that funny thing where everybody knows that feeling of when you return to your parents' house or when you're with your more, you know, your extended family, how you, you turn back into someone else, you know, <laughs> yes. and the whole thing just fascinates me yeah. how the dynamic of the interaction of, uh, so yeah. who are we then if we're just somebody else all the time, you know, right. so where's the core? And, um, and I think people just misunderstand each other so much in families. Everybody gets hurt by everybody else. And, you know, and I, I think generally most people are doing the best they can, but um, I don't know. It's just fraught with, with um, the, the archetype of story, isn't it? <laughs> right. And just think this family didn't even have to deal with the election this year. <laughs> Yeah. how they bad it would have been problems. on this family. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. They had enough to deal with. Well, we'll see if all of our families survive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, the other thing that's often said about your books uh, by people smarter than me, like Antonia Nelson, Cheryl Strait, and Tim O'Brien, is that they're just beautifully written. Um, and they absolutely are. I found Pale Morning Light to be really transporting at this point when we're dealing with so many things. To be able to escape into this world that is not like a happy-go-lucky world, but it is a beautifully wrought world and it's rich with um, just real human drama and um, but also transcendent of, of human drama. Um, and so I think of you as, you know, there are people who are just beautiful writers. Doesn't matter. They could be writing, you know, a phone book and the words are going to just be <laughs> elegant and lovely. Um, is that something you think about at all when you're writing? I mean, because it's, you know, beautiful, elegant language seems deceptively simple to write. And it's actually really not. And you can tell when someone doesn't get it right. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I think, um, I think this is perhaps where my own personal artistry comes in. You know, we were talking about art earlier and I can't paint and I can't even draw like a stick person, <laughs> but I have such an appreciation for it. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, you know, I grew up, uh, my dad was a musician. There's a lot of music in my family. I think my ear was certainly um, tuned to language 
and the rhythms of yeah. storytelling. And I think that's part of an artistry with fiction. But I think that's really the beauty um, I find of, of fiction itself, the art form of fiction that you can use metaphor and um, all of these sensory details um, mm -hmm. to create a, a work as a whole. Um, right. And, uh, you know, you can, you can convey a, a truth, a universal truth in your storytelling and you can um, make it, so you can write a plot so that people want to want to turn the page. But the books that I love to read the most don't e even always have plot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They're sort of these contemplative, um, rhythmic, right. introspective, Sure. Um, takes on on um, the the dark the darkness and the light of mm -hmm. of, of our humanity. So sure. I think, and I'm I'm influenced from those writers as right. well. What writers would you say? Are, are... Um, well, I love um, Marilyn Robinson. Always mm. a favorite. Oh, Kent, goodness, yes. yeah, Kent Harif, mm. um, Mark Sprag. You know, mm. a lot of writers from from the West, it seems. The West. <laughs> Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> you know. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. But I also love Elizabeth Strout, um, you know, and she's Maine. Sure. Um, I, I but love- Maine is really just like the, the West Coast. Yeah, it? it's like our sister, <laughs> it's our sister state, isn't it? So I guess I'm just making my own point here, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, and of course, Southern, Southern writers. Oh, well, the, well, yeah, the, you know, the, my, the musicality of Southern writers. Yeah, and, my, and I should say that my family comes from the South. My dad's yeah. from Georgia, and my mother's from West Virginia. So Interesting. Yep, there you go. And you have no accent. No, I was raised in the Midwest, so it's, yeah, okay. it's, but we're all over the place, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, over the course of writing five literary novels, how have you seen your own art change or progress or gotten easier, harder? What's different now than when you started? Um, it's definitely gotten easier. I mean, I, I say that with a great assault because it's all, it all feels so hard, you know, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you think I'm never going to finish this book. And what, why did I even think I knew how to write? And why did they trust me to write? <laughs> I mean, you just go around and around in your head. Um, and it feels very, very difficult. But I will say, for example, you know, this book took me two years to write. And it was a pretty pleasant experience. I think it was more more pleasant than maybe any book I've, I've oh, written. Oh, that's good. Um, I just, I just found the, that I love spending time with the characters, but I also think my skill set over the years has obviously it, it increased. Mm -hmm. But for example, like my novel, Things We Set on Fire, that was the first novel I tried to write. Mm -hmm. And I, there were some complex um, uh, emotions and, and relationships in there between um, two sisters and their mother. And, um, and, and a couple of nieces. And I, I didn't want it to be sappy or sentimental. And I didn't really know how to not make it that because of the problems they were having. And it actually took me all from beginning to end 16 years to mm -hmm. write that book. And yeah. so, you know, there's a, each book kind of has, has had its own pace and its own, um, its own needs that I've had to step up to, but that one took 16 years and then this one took two. So, um, but I, I, I do think it's gotten easier. I, I can catch myself a lot quicker now. And I'm also not afraid to put down on the page um, the, the cliche that comes into my head first. Like I know that it's, it's just a placeholder. Right, I used right. to just stop myself and be right. like, oh, I can't write because I'm all I can think of is this cliche. <laughs> and I would just sit there I until, you. <laughs> you know, until my head was about hey. to explode you know, for days and weeks. Like, and now it's like, oh yeah, I know it's a cliche. I was I'll just come back. Yeah. It. It's a placeholder. It's right, a, right. So that, that definitely speeds things up. A little bit more shitty first draft. Oh, for Anne, sure. Anne Lamott. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not a fan of writing a shitty first draft, but you have to. I mean, you just have it's to make yourself this, just write it. That's right. It's how yeah. it works. It, it just, really is. No matter how, we don't want it to be the way it works. No, I know. You just don't show it to anybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. So of all the characters in the book, who did you feel, I don't know, who do you feel most close to? 
Well, there were two. I mean, ultimately, mostly I would say Violet, but a very close second would be Penny, her daughter-in-law. Um, I felt that because the, the, between the two characters, you know, Violet, Violet knew she was an artist from the time she was a child mm -hmm. and she knew what she wanted and she pursued it regardless of everything that went wrong in her life. She had a singular focus and she got it. She did exactly as she wanted. And Penny ha did not. Penny has, um, she fell into the role of trying to be um, the right kind of wife and the right kind of mother and worrying about everybody mm -hmm. and um, having those things um, sort of take over the person that she is and, and, and losing herself in the course of, of that. And so um, I, felt, I felt like at different times of my life, I both of those people that's right. me and yeah. um and so i i did i felt um especially the the chapters with penny struggling to um you know her son has grown and my my sons are grown and they're off living in los angeles on their own and you know that that feeling of you know you want them back but you don't want to smother them you want them to go off and have their own lives but would can't they just be have their own lives you know nearby right here or, you know <laughs> Right here. One, one town yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, so, you know, I, 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 it, was, it was cathartic for me to, to put that on the page, actually, because my youngest son is 23, so he hasn't been out of the house for that long, you know, and um, I, uh, so I definitely related to, to Penny and, um, uh, and the struggles of the family in that, in that regard, and um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Violet yeah. was just, she just barreled through and, and said, this is my life and I'm yeah. taking it. And They're very much two sides of a female conundrum. Exactly. Exactly. Go for what you want and get it or right. you do the whole, you know, life script that women often get into, which is caring for others in some way or other through work, right. through family, through whatever. Exactly. And so Violet, Violet had her, you know, her husband, Richard was the caretaker. He did most right. of the raising of their son, but then, you know, their son had an issue with that. And with, you know, Penny and, and uh, Francisco, um, their son, Daniel, Penny did nearly all of the caretaking, you know, so she had a That's you right. know, resentment for that, you know, it was like, it happens. yeah, right. yeah. Um, we're going to turn it over to some questions really soon, but I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about well, what I think of one of the best trends of this decade is the number of authors purchasing bookstores and running them and, oh. and making them even more wonderful than they already were, um, like Ann Patchett and Louise Erdrich, and now you. <laughs> so, um, and Kelly Link. Kelly Link bought. Kelly Link. Yeah. Oh, um, right, right, right. Yeah, on the East Coast. That's right. Um, Oh, it's just been so wonderful. Tell us how that's all been. Yeah, it's just wonderful. I mean, pandemic and all, you know, it's, um, it's been terrific. Actually, I was finishing up Pale Morning Light um, at the time I was in the middle of purchasing the bookstore. Oh, wow. And so I, I, I set up the timing wise for it to be that as soon as I handed in the book, I took the keys and the bookstore was mine. I, I couldn't take over the bookstore until I had had this in. But, um, but in the course of finishing the book, as, as you will, as readers will see and you saw, there is a bookstore in the book and a character running a bookstore yes. in the book. <laughs> and it just made its way in. And I just, that was just sort of a, a sweet um, thing for me. It was almost like the future um, of what is headed. And that's sort of, yeah. you know, what you see in the book as, as well. But um, the bookstore has been, it's just been wonderful. You know, I, I've lived in Manzanita for about six years and the, um, as a writer, most of that time. And so just kind of hidden away, have friends here, you know, we know plenty of people, but not really that connected to the community because the, the opportunities just haven't really been there. I've been working so much writing. Right. And what's been one of the wonderful things about owning the bookstore is getting connected to my community. I'm getting to know, I've gotten to know everybody. You I know mean, everybody now. More yeah. names than I can remember. And um, 
and getting to see what their reading preferences are and building relationships with them and you know donating books and money and for certain um charities and organizations and i started a, a pandemic uh fund for um that if you know during this time if you can't afford books i people have given money to a fund and you can just oh. come in and tell me and you know i'll put it on that fund and so um that's really so cool. th that has been yeah. wonderful and mm -hmm. and just the satisfaction of being in a bookstore <laughs> surrounded by books yeah. the smell of paper and ink and the 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 uh, the exchange of ideas with mm -hmm. other people the that feeling of people getting excited when you recommend a book and they love it and they come back and they tell you that they loved it and want another recommendation and you get to talk about the book and the writing. I mean, right. I have, I have several customers that I just absolutely adore when I see them coming. I just, I just light, I know I light up because we're going to have the most interesting conversations. Right. And that was never, um, I wasn't having daily exchanges like that no, gosh, <laughs> before. No, as a writer. <laughs> no, I was having them with imaginary people in my head. <laughs> in front of a computer all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's been, that's been incredibly satisfying. Yeah. And also people, um, the previous owner, Jody Swanson, who mm -hmm. um, you know, I know as well. um, she, she told me that um, running a bookstore um, is a lot like being a bartender, that people will come in and they will tell you things. And she's right. They, they come in and they just tell you all kinds of things and um, like personal stories and they just talk and talk. And it's, it's just, um, it's kind of amazing. It's kind of, a, it's just incredible that you're, well, there's something about the space that you're in that people feel um, safe and warm and welcome and open. Like they just, they just open up and right. um, in a, in a lovely way though. Right. So that's, that's awesome. been a that's been a that's nice lovely. surprise. And yeah. do you find that you're reading in different areas than you might have in the past, so that you know what books your customers might want to read, or uh, how does not, that work? Yeah, I've, I well, <laughs> I read I read more than I ever have, which is yeah. really saying a lot. And yeah. it's like uh, because they're just coming at me so fast. It's like oh, I know the next one that's coming in, and I'm excited about. So I'm gonna hurry up and finish this one. Yeah, you know I about can, all of them now. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I have been reading um, a lot more nonfiction than mm -hmm. I used to or mm -hmm. generally do um, because, well, I just, I think uh, that there's just seems to be a lot of really wonderful nonfiction books out right now, um, okay. like Late Migrations, Margaret Rankle's book, um, just these lovely contemplative, you know, kind of like the the fiction that I love to read, mm -hmm. but in nonfiction, um, Homesick by Jennifer Croft, um, uh, Grove, uh, oh, that's a, that's a novel, but it's, it's sort of auto fiction, but um, Eula Biss's new collection, um, Having and Being uh, Had, um, there's just so, so many, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm still reading fiction like crazy, wow. Wow. so. So that would bring me then to, um, uh, what might you be working on when you get back to writing? Well, I've started um, dabbling in a new, on a new project, a new book. Um, I, I put down the ideas for it and it just sort of started taking off and that's how I kind of knew, well, I guess this yeah. is the next book. And I, I can tell you that it, um, it features um, Quincy, the bookstore owner um, from Pale Morning Light. Um, Qu Quincy's actually a um, child character from my novel, Things We Set on Fire. Oh. So I do a little bit of what Elizabeth That's Stroud fun. does. Yeah. Like you will find different characters crossing over in different books of mine. They mm -hmm. sort of do cameo appearances. Mm -hmm. And um, Quincy was a fairly major character in Things You Set on Fire. She was a little girl mm -hmm. and um, with her sister. And so that's hinted to in Pale Morning Light. But um, what I thought I, I would do is go back and revisit her as a child. It, like what happened between, between that book. 
the two books. <laughs> oh, I'm fascinated yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, because we know from, we, we know from Pale Morning Light that her mother died when she was young right. and her father raised her and her sister. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that's about all you know about her and, and the fact that she took over her aunt's house um, in, in uh, Mistucka Beach in, in the, on the coast. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'm going to have her... Um, basically she stops talking for a year and um, these two older women um, become friends in the course of trying to get her back into um, the world um, you know communication and locked out of the place that she's in and um, so it's fun I'm writing from a young child's perspective who doesn't speak and from the perspective of two older women who are kind of cantankerous and not used to making friends at their age, <laughs> but the situation brings the three of them together. And it seems, oh, that to, sounds be, great. It seems to be working. Yeah. 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 Sounds really good. <laughs> well, now we don't have any questions so far. I'm not sure that we oh, will. So we, let's, we can do just, we, do we have to throw it out there to say, okay, he's now, been doing now it's time. Time to, yes, time to ask your questions. Okay. Sam has been asking in the chat for people that oh, okay. want to ask any, any questions, questions. Okay. put it up in the Q&A. Um, but we can just keep chatting until I see one pop up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> now we're just, <laughs> now, <laughs> now I'm tongue tied. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know what, I see, here's the thing is I, I never ask certain questions because I know an audience member will. So I'll just ask you oh, what I know okay. the audience members ask. Can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? How you come to writing each day or do you come only once a week and how do you do it? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. Well, I'm a very early riser and on the days when I'm working, I, and I'm really into um, the, the book, I, I will um, get up very early five o'clock or so, get some coffee, make a smoothie, <laughs> get to my desk. And I kind of work throughout the day. I mean, by around two o'clock or so, I am absolutely beat. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll take a break and, um, and just go back and read over what I've, what I've done. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a process where I, I write, I always write uh, chronologically. So I start at the beginning every day. I go back to the start and I read what I've written and then I add a little bit to it. And then the next day I go back and I read and then, you know, and so it, it gets longer each day, but I find that if I don't read through, even when I'm at 200 pages, I'm still, I'm going to read all the way through because it puts me fully back into the life right. of the story and it it's so much easier than for me even if i only end up writing three pages that day um because i read 200 um it, it still brings me exactly where i right need to where to you be. need to be yeah you and i are not dissimilar in that oh, i yeah i have a very similar process to you but i would never get up at 5 a.m <laughs> Wow, that's so interesting, Jenny, because I've never met another writer who writes like that. I oh, pretty that's... much do. Sometimes I'll only read what I wrote, you know, in the week prior, perhaps. Yeah. Like if I'm well into, say, part two instead of, uh -huh. like, I can leave part one where it was. I, I feel like that's good, but I need to know how to go forward okay. in this particular section. But yeah. You know what? We have some questions now. Oh, okay. so excited. Okay. So um, uh, this was my next question for you, but Daniel has asked, how do you balance your writing in the bookstore? Well, um, that's yet to be seen. Um, well, because the pandemic has um, slowed the writing process down a bit as I'm trying to keep, um, you know, uh, everything in order at the store. And, um, but I will say that because I'm an early riser, I, get up at five uh, and the store doesn't open until 10. So that leaves me several oh, hours. Yep. And at the moment I'm only in the store physically three days a week. I have two wonderful employees okay, who right. are there on the uh, uh, two days each, the other mm -hmm. two days. So I'm just there Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And um, the rest of the stuff I can do from home, but it really does give me, it opens up my schedule. And now that we have it, 
you know, this system down of, you know, the wearing masks and only allowing a certain amount of people in, you know, and yeah. the hours are shorter. It's like, it's all set up now, COVID set up. Right. We've got the plexiglass and yeah. the air filters and everything. Now that I've managed to get everything in place, I think, um, you know, yeah. just in time for the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have I more know. time, probably. After probably the not. holidays. Yeah. But yeah <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I can, I, it's easy to envision now how things are settling into a rhythm right. and I can, I can return. But I do still dabble every morning on this manuscript. I am yep. just chipping away at it. There's a saying that I really like, and that's just to touch it every day, at least touch it every day. Yes. If you're working on a book, yes. if you just visit it and read something or add, yes. change a word, add a sentence, or sit there and write for as many hours comma. as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Put in a comma, yeah. then take it out, that whole yeah. thing. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's important to keep in touch with it. Okay. We're, yeah. We have more questions for you. Okay. Good. Um, Laura would like to know what the setting or room is that you, where you do your writing. Um, I have my own office. It's um, upstairs and um, it's a super cozy space. I almost did the, the, this from there, but um, I, I thought it would be nice to have the fire going in the back and a little more, a little more room um, and the lighting is better down here. But um, no, I, I just, I write at home and uh, I've always had an, a home office mm -hmm. and um, it's, it, I, I can't write in public or even, you know, before the pandemic, I'm not the kind of person that can write in a coffee shop or anything like that. I, yeah. I have to have complete quiet. Yeah. I get distracted easily by noise. And, head. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Is your office neat or sloppy? My office is neat, but my desk is sloppy. That's the only <laughs> I'm in my space. It's like okay. piles of paper. Everywhere. What we can see, it looks great. <laughs> it's very carefully curated. Um, Judy would like to know if you ever start writing and totally tear it up and start with a totally different idea. Never, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know, I, there's only one book. And the answer basically, surprisingly, is no. Um, you know, this is my seventh novel and every novel I set out to write, I ended up writing that novel, except for this one, this one. And I, I'm actually going to talk about this tomorrow with my editor in a, in a, um, event that I'm doing for the Manzanita writer series. Um, because, um, it was a kind of an ongoing thing between us, but it, it, has, it's, it's a novel that has to do with, um, J. Edgar Hoover. And wow. which it just, you know, not even sounding like something that I would normally write, but there's an aspect of his story and the, and some agents that worked for him that I have been intrigued with for years. And I still think I'm going to write that book. Um, but I just haven't done it yet. And I might, I might end up writing it as a screenplay instead as I, I think maybe that might be part of the issue is that it would, it would, it maybe would do better as a screenplay than a mm -hmm. novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, sometimes you have to consider that. And also I just think the time has to be right in your life, in the world, yes. whatever has happened. Sometimes you need things to have happened before you actually understand what, it, why you want to yeah. write that. Yeah, I agree. Oh, we have quite a few questions. <clears throat> awesome. Okay. I'm ready. Allison says, I'm an avid birder and love how specific you are in the book, the Northern Flicker, the Cerulean Warbler. Are you also a birder? Um, well, I wouldn't. And also, how I do mean, you choose which birds you put in? Well, because for one thing, the Northern Flicker does exactly to my house what it does in this book. It yeah. gets up on the roof and bangs, <laughs> hammers on the, um, the gutter, the rain gutter and freaks us out, you know, in the mornings. And so it did make its way in, into the book. Um, uh, I would say that my husband is the birder. He's the uh, one who, um, I mean, I love birds and I know what most of them are, but he's, you know, he's got an in-depth, um, he's got a, a next level <laughs> understanding mm -hmm. of, about birds that I don't have. And I sort of um, follow his, his lead on that. Um, he takes care of the bird feeder and the, you know, the hummingbird feeder and, um, uh, and he could make bird calls with his mouth and literally call chickadees into the trees like <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Doolittle. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a very talented birder. Yes. 
<laughs> um, I like this question uh, from Libby. She says, can you talk about your character's relationship with nature? Yes, yes. Um, in particular, since I moved to um, Manzanita, and in both of my last two books, um, there was a lot of grief and a lot of loss in both of the books. And um, I was experiencing some of that myself. And, you know, the natural world is so healing. Um, and I, I actually quote Mary Oliver in the book. I use a couple of Mary Oliver poem uh, lines from her poems and, you know, it, she's she's a perfect example of writing that draws your attention to the natural world the beauty of the natural world and how healing it is mm. and it's it's like right outside my windows you know yeah. i can sit at my desk and watch a bald eagle flying out you know yeah. um there are these giant dug firs i can hear the ocean um the the negative ions are in the air which are also very healing and uh and so because my characters live here this is their setting that's of course part of their character mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and it's you know it's meaningful to me too personally right well that's how it comes through so well in your stories oh, thanks <laughs> um dana wants to know if you ever get emotional when you write oh gosh yes <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know if you you do you like I I will write a scene and then cry and then every time I go back to the scene it still chokes me up and the, you know it's an indication that I got it right for starters because especially if I'm trying to do something that's emotionally complex and I if I don't feel emotion right. when I'm reading it and writing it then I don't think the reader will either but yeah. oh yeah I go through the whole gamut of emotions of you know crying and mm -hmm. getting angry and mm -hmm. um and then um avoidance you know <laughs> when you, <laughs> when you have two characters who are who have to have an argument I'm like yeah I'll, I'll write that after lunch <laughs> you know like, I just don't want to get into it I, yeah it's kind of like being an actor right don't you feel that way where you oh you very have... much and one of the reasons I like to write by myself with no one else around is that I'll find that I'm like acting it out. Well, yeah, thinking of how would I describe a certain hand motion or a yeah. certain expression, and I'll just have oh, yeah. to be doing all these things or making sounds, and how would I describe Ugh, or you know whatever? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> It'd be really embarrassing if anyone was right. or getting up and like moving a chair and falling down and like yeah, trying to figure. Yeah, I know it's yeah. a weird. When you fall down, what part hits first? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. All yeah, true. It's true. <laughs> Let's wrap this lovely conversation up with one more question from Kevin. And he okay. says, of the books you've read in the past couple of years, what are some hidden gems? And also, are there any upcoming books you're excited to read? Hmm. Um, well, one I mentioned already, Homesick by Jennifer Croft. Uh, Jennifer Croft is a translator. Um, she is a polyglot. And um, she, the, her book, uh, Homesick, is, it says, um, uh, I, I forgot, it's a, something like the subtitle, something like um, a novel, a memoir and a novel or something. What it is, is she, she tells part of it in third person and part of it in first when she captions these photographs that she took. So it's her story, oh, but wow. she moves in and out of the past and the present and in and out of her own story and sort of seeing it uh, um, more objectively. And it's so beautifully done. She, um, she won the Booker Prize for translating Olga Toksorguk's book, Flights. Mm -hmm. And she just translated um, another one of her stories into a collection called um, Freeman's. But um, Jennifer's fascinating. I'm always fascinated with people who speak mm. multiple languages and she speaks mm -hmm. German and Polish. And so her writing really intrigues me as do, yeah. as do her um, translations. And um, I just finished reading Elena Ferrante's new book, um, The Lying Life of Adults, which I enjoyed thoroughly. It's a, it's set apart from that, um, the quartet of um, mm -hmm. novels. And um, it was one of those books that was absolutely exhausting. I was exhausted and I couldn't stop. She was just like taking me on this ride and 
I felt like physically, like I was exhausted, but um, it was, it's so well done. It's so beautifully written in. And also it's translated. I, I do tend toward a lot of books in translation. Yeah, that's um, uh, and it's translated from Italian and it feels very Italian. It feels Italian. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the beauty of it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I've, and I've really enjoyed Margaret Rankle's late, late migrations, um, it, which is nonfiction. It's a, it's just a beautiful collection of essays of, she's very attached to the natural world as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are the ones that immediately uh, come to mind. For our, for our viewers, um, all these book titles, Sam's doing a great job of getting links for them and putting them up in the chat. If you are interested in checking any of these books out, just go over there into the chat. You can see some of those books. You can have a, get a link to Cloudleaf Bookstore. You can get a link to an event that, um, that um, is coming up with the Manzanita Writer Series that I think maybe you should tell us about, Deborah your next event. The, okay, so that is tomorrow at, at four o'clock uh, Pacific time. And it is with my editor from Houghton Mifflin Hardcore. She's um, Nicole Angelaro. She's, um, she's the, she manages the Mariner, the imprint, um, uh, paperback imprint. And she's also head of the best of series, like the best essays of oh, 2020, yeah. best of, oh, you know, best okay. short stories of yeah. each year. And, um, and so we're going to have a conversation about um, the making of this book and what um, editors and, and, and writers, um, how we interact with each other, what that relationship is like. And, um, it should be it should be really fun and and interesting um, for for anybody, but I think in particular for for writers, mm -hmm. um, there you do have to register and it is uh, uh, ten dollars to attend, and the money goes toward the Hoffman Center for the Arts, which is an incredible organization out Absolutely. here on the coast that supports artists of all kinds. Great. Well, thank you, Deborah, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you both. That was, that was so fun. Thank you. Indeed. It has been such a pleasure to listen to the two of you. And uh, what a great way to spend, for, for me at least, to spend my Friday night. Uh, this has been lovely. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Sam. Um, as, as Jenny says, uh, we've dropped some links in the chat uh, to some Jenny Shortridge books and, uh, and more on our website as well. Deborah Reed's previous books and, of course, the incredible new novel Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. You have not heard the last of this novel. Um, this is one that people are going to be talking about for quite a while. And if you're not, if, if you weren't convinced at the beginning of this talk uh, to read this book, I think you probably are now. There is a link in the chat to pick that up and uh, some other great recommendations. Always great question to ask a writer and a bookseller. What are you, what are you reading? Yes. Um, so thank you so much to both of you. Um, again, thank we've been you. here with Deborah Reed, with Jenny Shortridge. We're so glad to have uh, spent the last hour with both of them. And wherever you're joining us from tonight, we hope that we'll see you again here for one of our events uh, at Third Place Books. And we thank you so much for your support. Wherever you are tonight, be safe. Do good work, read good books, and everyone, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Deborah Reed, Jenny Shortridge, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Thank, thank, you, Sam. thank oh. you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Jenny. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.